All right, I will begin then. So thanks a ton for coming out to uh, schema.org, Wikidata, and uh, the Knowledge Graph. Strands of the modern web, modern semantic web. Um, so Casey asked me to come and talk about schema.org, and I kind of thought, no, I want to blow up the, the approach a little bit much, because schema.org has been very focused, in my mind, on very small pieces, and I want to look at some of the big picture as well. Um, and who am I? I am a Canadian. I'm from Sudbury, Ontario. Laurentian University is where I work. Um, and before I be joined the systems librarian world, I worked at uh, IBM for about eight years on DB2 relational database. So uh, I am really passionate about collecting, organizing, and making the world's information available, which is sort of like the, one of the sponsors of this um, conference. So. To try and uh, give a bit of a display, oh, I should probably go into full screen mode here. Um, I wanted to give a really crappy diagram to kind of show some of the relationships between uh, how the knowledge graph and wiki data um, sort of IDs would, uh, would work out. So the knowledge graph you might be familiar with um, is great for IDs. Wikidata also has IDs, but also provides relationships um, and uh, other entities um, around the edges of the web to kind of fills out the graph uh, of knowledge. And so if you've got a web that's being built, then schema.org kind of provides the data, which is sort of like the bugs that provide the raw material for building more of the web. Um, so you end up with something more like this. Now, imagine great artistic skills, um, but this is how we build things out. And um, talking about schema.org or um, sort of uh, uh, annotations of data on the web, um, I go back to another great Larry, Larry Wall, um, who uh, talks about laziness as a virtue. And uh, my start with sort of schema.org came in 2012 when I was at a talk by Ade Oshinai um, on, he was talking about Google Plus business pages and talking about how fantastic they were. They'd show up on Google Maps and they'd give you your business hours and your address and contact information. And I asked him, well, can you provide a right API so we don't have to update it on our websites and we have to update it on Facebook and we have to update it on Google Plus and umpteen other spots? And he said, well, you should talk to Dan Brickley about schema.org. So thus began about four years of pretty hard work to try and avoid updating one extra spot on the web uh, for me. Um, so linked open data like, like that aspires to be lazy in that you publish uh, your data to a web page or a set of web pages, and you hope that someone will come along um, and crawl it and be spared some of the natural language processing named entity recognition type of work that Karen just talked about, um, but will have actual statements of facts and identifiers that can be linked across things. So, um, and then on the, the flip side, you know, there's going to be somebody who's going to do the hard work of actually crawling all that. You know, there's lots of companies that have lots of machines that do that sort of um, on a minute by minute basis. They might aggregate it for you and then you can pull it, pull from it as well. So you could be a producer and a consumer in a really lazy way, which would be fantastic. Um, so that was where I kind of started from. But we also have this whole sort of thing where you're know, traveling to a new place, I'm coming to Ohio, I want to know a little bit about the political landscape, I don't want to talk about the national landscape, so I focus on the, the state. And you can ask questions like, who's the governor of Ohio? And so you've got things like uh, the Google Knowledge Graph, which will give you um, a, a nice answer. In fact, in this case, I said, when was the governor of I Ohio born? Um, so in the back end, the query parser is figuring out the governor of Ohio, what that means, and then it's relating that to an entity, and then it's asking the question, when was he born, and it's relating that to a fact. Um, Microsoft has something like this too, called uh, Bing Knowledge, and you'll see these fact cards have been popping up in various spots for the past number of years on, uh, on various properties. So where does the knowledge graph get that data from? Um, in a large part, it comes from Freebase, um, sort of historical uh, artifact, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, it is pulling some of this data, some of the images, some of the descriptions from uh, Wikipedia, um, and now from Wikidata. Uh, it is crawling the web and extracting some facts. Um, disclaimer, as I don't know, I don't work for Google, I don't know exactly how much it is pulling from this, but there was a paper published in 2014 um, called uh, On the Google Knowledge Vault that talked about how they tried different approaches to pull some of this uh, data together and uh, 
create pages and, and uh, uh, nodes in the graph for entities and relationships. Um, and they also have licensing. Um, so they've got the privilege of pulling in data that is not under a, an open license. Uh, they can pay uh, companies to get access to it. So you can think of, say, a large library cooperative just down the road in Dublin um, who libraries pay lots of money to have them take our data um, and expose it just on human visible pages. And then we pay for money to get access to that data from other libraries but they also sell that data to Google to use for um, holdings and other sorts of interesting uh, pieces. So um, that's an example of one type of license data that uh, can be in the knowledge graph. So Freebase. Freebase was this awesome open graph database that uh, MetaWeb, uh, a company with Formed, launched in 2007. And it was bulk loaded, uh, it had a combination of sources, but largely bulk loaded with data uh, from sort of trusted sources, and it had a little bit more flexible terms for its data than, say, um, uh, Wikidata does, um, but is also editable by individuals. And you could drill down on uh, various types, types of types, um, and it really focused on the entities and the relationships between those entities as well as statements of fact. So here we're kind of uh, drilling down through uh, the fictional universes and seeing all the properties on the left that, uh, or relationships that the fictional universe might have. It might have uh, different characters, um, it might have uh, sibling relationships, it might have all kinds of these elements. But you can look at the, um, uh, the structure of the, the schema that was in Freebase, um, but you can also look at the instances of those fictional universes, and in this case, looking at some of the characters that live in the fictional universe. So you can see the Buffyverse, which is one of my favorite fictional universes, has a list of characters in it, and you can drill down on information about those as you go through. Unfortunately, um, as with all things, um, this resource was probably under-publicized, under-utilized, and um, a lot of the data got absorbed into the Google Knowledge Graph, um, and then it uh, unfortunately got shut down um, in 2016 when Google purchased it in 2010. Um, they gave lots of notice, and they, um, they did say, okay, Google, that is, said, we're not gonna take it away until there is a search API that you can use to replace some of the functionality that Freebase had. Um, and so, there was a great auto-suggest widget, and there was um, availability to all the data in Freebase, and there was also uh, an API for searching and retrieving data. So there is now the Knowledge Graph, um, and you can um, use the Knowledge Graph search API by going to the developer console and flipping on the, the Knowledge Graph search API, um, and you get uh, 100,000 requests per day uh, for free in the, the free tier of data. You can ask for more. They might say, oh, maybe you need to pay us, but uh, you're probably not going to ask for more for most applications. They've got 17,000 discovery request quota as well, and I've never triggered one of those, so it's not entirely clear to me what that is. Maybe a stub of something that might be coming in the future. Um, and you can pull back a total of 200 results for any match um, that you're pulling uh, from. So. Um, to build a discovery widget that is very similar to what the Freebase auto-suggest wi widget was, um, you're basically looking at a link out to a chunk of JavaScript, a link out to a style sheet, uh, and an input uh, ID. So if uh, the network gods are kind, we might be able to, yeah, see this awesome demo um, that's running live right now. Um, give me an entity to search and a name of somebody. Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks, fantastic. All right, so there's Rosa Parks, comes up, reasonable relevance. Um, so we can click on it, and then this just gives me a link out to the actual page that will resolve with all of the facts and all the data. So that's kind of cool. And, but it's fairly limited as well, right? We just got sort of the ID and we got uh, a little description and, uh, and an image for most of the things that came up. So there's a search API as well, um, which is probably more useful to many of us um, because that way you don't have a widget um, that's sort of prepackaged for you um, and you can just do whatever you want on the server side. Um, and it's got the same sort of constraints. So um, you can constrain the uh, search widget um, or the search API to specific schema.org types. We'll talk a little bit more about schema.org later. So you can say, 
I just want you to search for books. Um, so books that have this sort of word in the description or the title. Um, or I want you to search for people um, or organizations or locations, those sorts of things. Um, and you can also look up those, uh, those specific uh, knowledge IDs. So in this case, M02ZZM underscore is the very clear identifier for John Kasich, um, governor of Ohio, for those who aren't from the area. And the results that you get from the, the Knowledge Graph Search API are much richer than you get from the widget. So here we're getting the JSON back, and you can see there's an item list of results. In this case, we just have one result. Um, you've got the ID for the Knowledge Graph, and we can see what its prefix is up here. JSON linked data, JSON LD, fantastic. You can see that uh, John Kasich is uh, listed as both a person and a thing. Um, that is not an insult, it's a hierarchical relationship all the way up to the top type of, of uh, type in schema.org, which is thing. Um, you get an image that it links to, um, and I've reported a bug that even if you're calling this via HTTPS, you get an HTTP link back, which is not super. Um, you get uh, a URL where, from, where some of the content came from, you know, a little bit, little bit more data. But this still looks nothing like the John Kasich knowledge graph page that had things like who is John Kasich married to? When was he born? Where was he born? Like all the other facts are missing from this. Um, oh, we do have a URL that identifies him, so his, uh, his personal web page. So that's, that's useful. Um, so as I mentioned, the URLs for the IDs do resolve, um, and even though URIs don't have to resolve, it's nice when they do, and we look it up and we get this uh, nice little card that gives a little bit of information. Again, seen that many times before. Um, but there are a number of problems with this. So the constraints lead to very poor precision. Um, there is no way to re uh, restrict the search to the name of the entity. Um, it's always going to be searching the description as well, uh, and that can really throw things off. Like when I search for Buffy, I want Buffy the character. Don't show me all the um, uh, actors who played Buffy or um, anything, any of the comic books about Buffy. Um, which leads to another problem. Um, you'd say, well, why don't you just limit it to a specific type of person? Um, fictional characters, there is no corresponding type in schema.org to a fictional character. Persons are real in schema.org, or so it's been interpreted by the knowledge graph. So you can only restrict to thing, which is the broadest possible category. Uh, and that happens a fair bit. Um, so that can also be a bit of a pain point. Um, and we get really limited results back, so we don't get the useful like statements um, or facts uh, that are out there um, that we know the knowledge graph has. Um, so that's a little bit annoying. Um, and really what you're missing is all of the relationships between knowledge graph entities, um, right? So uh, John Kasich does have actually a prior spouse and a current one, and it'd be nice to be able to follow the relationship trail. It'd be nice to go to McKees Rock, uh, Pennsylvania, I think is wh where he was born, and find out more about the, the place that he was born. But you can't do that through the, the knowledge graph itself. Um, and they recommend using the Wikidata dump if you want to go and pull that data uh, yourself, right? So, hey, Google tells me to go to Wikidata, I'll go to Wikidata. Welcome to Wikidata. Wikidata. Um, so if you go to wikidata.org, this is the kind of greeting that you'll get um, and we're developers, so we're interested in the APIs that we have access to. So there is a search entities API that's very similar to the Google Knowledge Graph search API. Um, you kind of search for a string. Um, there's not a whole lot of other options to it, and it will give you back a list of uh, potentially matching results. And it's, it doesn't have a per day limit. Its limit is just only call us one one at a time, don't have like 100 instances hitting us because we're a nonprofit and we don't have that kind of mass to scale up. Um, and you might get cut off if you are found to be using it determined what, by whatever their server-side algorithm is. Um, but you can do this. Um, and you do lose some of the, the results. Like if you search for the governor of Ohio um, with this API, you're going to get nothing back. Um, it's pretty limited to the labels of the, uh, the entity, so the names of the things. Um, it's not searching across descriptions. So sort of, in some ways, 
the opposite of the problem that we had with the knowledge graph um, discovery widget and search API where it's, you have no way of constraining it. This way you have no way of uh, spreading it out. Well, then why are we talking about it so much? Well, it's still worthwhile to take a look at see what kind of data you get back from this. Um, so you'll see we've got an identifier that uh, comes from uh, Wikidata, Q6319. Um, you've got a full-on URI that you can resolve, you can look at. Um, and if you resolve that for humans, uh, humans will get this nice page where you can immediately start editing it, very Wikipedia-like, um, where you can add in other statements, you can delete other people's statements. Um, you, you know, uh, I have done this with Lollapalooza, where someone said the country of origin for Lollapalooza was Macedonia, which I might have believed if they had provided a reference, but they didn't, so I deleted it and said reference needed, as one does in this world. Um, and so, so you can see we've, we do have relationships here, right? We've got the country of citizenship, United States of America. America is an entity itself. I can drill down and then pull up more information about United States of America. Um, so that's a human view, but there's also a JSON view. And so this is absolutely clear, right, um, what this is saying. Um, let's maybe try and take a look at this. Um, with the nice JSON formatter online. So we can see pretty quickly we've got the ID, we've got labels in different languages um, for uh, John Kasich. Um, if I scroll down a little bit after I get through all of the John Kasichs in the different languages, uh, then we've got a description, and he is an American politician in many different languages as well. Um, <laughs> Politicien américain, uh, for those who like French. I like French. Um, and there are then the claims sections. So these are all the statements of fact um, about uh, John Kasich. And so when I'm navigating this, I can see things like the property is P27. Um, Wikidata is very much into using opaque identifiers uh, to be um, equally supportive of all languages by sort of being supportive of none. You can look up what P27 means and find out the label for it. I mean, programmatically, or you can actually pop that into uh, Wikidata and track it down. Um, but sometimes if you drill through this far enough, you'll find something interesting like a date, which might be a position, a uh, time when he took over a position there, 1982. That probably is the date that he started a position, either as House of Representative or as a Senator um, or as the Governor of Ohio. And oh my God, this person has been in politics forever. <laughs> but that's probably good, right? That's why you have him. So, um, so we can see like these sorts of drilling down relationships. When he was born, the positions held. The United States representative is his, uh, the position that he did hold within that array of, of positions held and the start time for that uh, particular um, date. Now, if you're familiar with the semantic web and RDF in particular, the resource description framework, we talk about triples a fair bit. So really subjects, predicates, and objects. So we can see programmatically that Q6319, um, so the subject, John Kasich, was born P569 at this time, which is a date time date string. Um, so this is what you're going to be looking at under the covers is a, a ton of relationships, these triples all the way down. And people got super excited about triples um, and had like billion triple contests and whatever and is so horrendously academic um, that it kind of set back the semantic web probably by uh, five or 10 years. But we're at a working semantic web at this point with these, with the knowledge graph and Wikidata. So, you know, turn off the cynicism and turn on the, uh, the optimism. All right, so Sparkle endpoint. Um, anyone use Sparkle? Yes, yes, cool. So for those who don't know Sparkle, has anyone used SQL? Yeah, pretty much everybody's used SQL, right? So SQL is very much like Sparkle. You just have like, or sorry, Sparkle is very much like SQL, except you just add a PAR in the middle. Um, it's a recursive, it's, it's, you know it's cool because it's a recursive acronym. It's something like uh, Sparkle is the Sparkle protocol and retrieval query language, um, or request query language, uh, or RDF query language. Um, and it is a standard, which is super. Um, and so you do have a lot of the SQL-like structure to it. Um, and it works pretty well if you're coming from a relational database mindset for a little while. <laughs> Until it doesn't. 
um, because the graph makes things weird. So those nodes connecting to nodes connecting to nodes without being in a table in a very uh, linear structure makes things weird. So I've pulled together some examples and I'm going to hope, hope again that uh, our Wi-Fi works out and that things haven't changed in the back end. Um, because I had a really fun time on Sunday when I pulled together the last set of uh, queries and then on Tuesday they stopped working because someone changed the bi-directionality of a relationship in Wikidata, which broke all of my examples, which is fantastic. Um, so here, as an example, uh, can you see that okay? Or do you, do you want me to bump that up? Not hearing anything, I'll assume that there are many people who can't see things and bump it up. Um, so here I'm saying I want the label of the state, the name of the state, uh, the name of the person, and a picture, okay? Um, and I'm selecting that from this set of relations. So give me the triples where the state, um, if I hover over this, usually it'll be nice and it'll give me the, is an instance of the state of the United States. So I want a state from the United States, not from some other country. And I want the state uh, to have a head of government and that head of government is going to be my person or fill in my person um, identifier. And I also want an office in this case. Um, and I'm not actually using the query, so I'm gonna add it in right now because it's nice to know what the name of the, uh, the position held is going to be. And I'll make it optional that the person will have a, uh, a picture attached to them, so an image. Um, and then I use this magical service wiki base label clause. You could do filter on lang equals en, um, but all of their examples use this. So I, I believe blaze graph, which is underneath this, actually optimizes a little bit for the label of filters. And then we can order by the state label because we want to have things alphabetical because, you know, why not? So I'll run that uh, query slightly modified again and I can get pictures of, of the, um, all of our, Oh, wait, I've got the name of the state, but I don't actually have the office. Oh, that's right. I asked for the office, not the office label. Let's do that. Okay, that's better. So I've got all the governors. Governor of Alabama, Governor of Maine, Governor of Maryland, and where's Ohio? Come on. Oh, okay. Thank you. That's what I got. Right. Not smiling very much. That's okay. Um, so yeah, so that's an example of a Sparkle query. Uh, we can add in the birth dates. Things get a little bit, uh, not too much weirder. I just say, I, for each person I want a date of birth. Um, so I run that. And then we can get the same, I'm also using a little bit of a shortcut in Wikidata that says give me it in an image grid. If there's a picture attached to it, give me a picture of it, otherwise don't show it. Um, but there are displays where I can change what this looks like. So I can do a timeline and very quickly get an idea of when our current set of governors were born. Um, and it seems to range in between from the 1930s, most of them ending before 1970, and there's one who was born the same year I was born, um, and there's nothing past that, which is, I don't know, I find it kind of interesting. People with a lot of experience, maybe not necessarily of the same generation as many people now, um, but so that's the sort of set of data that you can very quickly pull together. Um, and one more example, I don't know. I like maps. Maps are a good way of visualizing things. Oh, I just opened that in a new tab. How about a new window instead? Maps help visualize. Um, in this case, it's not super exciting because you are all pretty familiar with the state of, uh, or all the states in the United States. So we can see Hawaii. If I click on that guy, we can see David Iga. Um, from Hawaii, and uh, I've kept, kept the birth dates around just because. So Wikidata builds a lot of this in as a front end. You can embed these sorts of views. They're, they can be queried dynamically. Um, you can, they get cached on the Wikidata side, so it doesn't harm their performance too badly. Um, there's a lot you can do with that. I'll skip the uh, bands formed in Cincinnati because, well, no, I won't. There's not many. It's, it's a big problem. Um, there are not many that are actually reflected here. And I'm sure, I'm sure there are way more than like the six or seven that showed up in the 2000s. Um, yeah, ass ponies, alternative country. That's pretty alternative, <laughs> I like it. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that's one of the advantages of Wikidata is that 
um, it can be edited and it can be extended uh, fairly easily. So our Sparkle endpoint, of course, you're not going to be, th this is a really useful tool, or the human visible tool was really useful for generating queries and trying things out, but programmatically, you're not going to be hitting that and requesting results. What you're going to be doing is hitting the Sparkle endpoint, which is basically just using a get param with all of that uh, select where order by um, stuff uh, URL encoded, and you get the results back. And you can say whether you want the results back in sort of a CSV table or JSON, uh, like we saw before, or in XML. Um, I would recommend the JSON, personally. Um, it does have limits, so if you screw up um, and you ask for something that's going to ask for you know, 35 million triples back from uh, uh, Wikidata, it'll time out after 30 seconds and stop. So not too bad. Um, so you can grab that on a, depending on what your use case is, you could run this query, grab the results um, on a daily basis and cache it locally if there's a bunch of data that you wanted to have that didn't need to be super, super fresh. All right, so talking about getting data into to Wikidata, there's the manual edits approach. Um, and so much like some places, some communities hold Wikipedia editing parties um, where they try and they beef up um, the information about a particular community or subset of their community or cultural uh, angle, um, you could do the same with Wikidata, right? You can flesh out the bands um, and give like images to bands that don't have images, or you could say, you know, I know there were like 15 other bands that were formed in the 1980s that are missing here and that's seminal and it's very important, right? So you can do that. Um, I'm part of a grant to actually do that for Canadian bands because we're woefully underrepresented um, and culture is really important when you're a, co a country of like 35 million people. Uh, you can be buried under the onslaught of uh, every other country in the world, especially the one that's right next door to us. Um, so thum thumbs up if that, uh, that goes forward. Um, so Freebase, um, as well as part of their, uh, once they'd been purchased by Google and Google said, okay, we want this data to live on in an open format, uh, the Freebase folks spent a lot of work working with Wikidata, which just started in uh, 2012. Um, they spent a lot of time working with the Wikidata uh, people to figure out, okay, uh, what sort of matches do we have on identifiers? Can we get as many of the entity identifiers from Freebase into Wikidata as possible? So we've got at least a starting match point. Okay, and then what sort of statements and claims can we get in? And where do we have clear provenance on the licensing for those statements and claims so that we're not breaking some of the, the licenses and claims? And there's a great paper about that from earlier this, this year um, that uh, it's on, called, I think, the Freebase to Wikidata Migration, um, where they talk about that process. And uh, they created 17 and a half million claims. So those are statements like birth date um, or where a person was born and added 1.5 million entities to Wikidata. So, uh, and that re represented only a percentage um, of what was in Freebase, but it was what they could cleanly do, and there's more that they're still trying to like, work through the curation process to get in there. Um, and 1.5 million entities uh, in total right now, Wikidata has 25 million entities, so that's a pretty significant chunk of, of, of addition, and those match points um, for IDs are like really, really super useful. Um, so beyond the edits and the bulk loading uh, through some of the bulk loading tools, there's also APIs, and there, there are possibilities of registering a bot that uses those APIs, so it goes through and automatically will annotate uh, data as it uh, finds entities that might apply. Um, so any of these still require that you meet the Wikidata, the Wikidata notability requirements. It's not the same level as Wikipedia. If any of you have ever tried creating a new Wikipedia page and then gotten slapped down and then you tried to put it back in and said, no, it's not a notable person. It's like, hey, this person is, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't want to get into Wikipedia levels, uh, editor levels of uh, notability. Wikidata, uh, their requirement are that the entity needs to um, either follow the Wikipedia requirements or that it needs to support, uh, usefully support other entities. So in that case, um, where a band name might be all that would be acceptable for Wikipedia because there is a lot written about a band and that you could point to sources, um, having the IDs of all of the band members in that band over time and when they're in the band and, and out um, might be 
uh, okay for Wikidata purposes. It might not be okay for Wikipedia to have a page for each one of those people, but that's okay. You don't have to have a one-to-one -one mapping between Wikipedia, Wikipedia pages and Wikidata. It's just, that's sort of how things have been bootstrapped so far. So it's four years old. It just celebrated its birthday on October 29th. It's a little bit like a normal four-year-old. Um, it's gone beyond the, oh, isn't that cute? To, it's actually got some useful data and some useful uh, APIs. Uh, and the data is all available for, for dumps if you uh, so desire, as knowledge graph uh, documentation suggested. Um, it is still growing, sort of fits and starts, depends on when new bulk loads of data come in versus the general um, Wikidata uh, editing. Um, it can be a little bit unstable, as demonstrated uh, earlier this week when my queries no longer worked. Um, <laughs> so that's worthwhile keeping an eye on. Um, and it will definitely require more guidance in terms of areas, potential for growth uh, for where it can grow rapidly. So I think the, some of the cultural, local cultural areas are some, some of the great potential for Wikidata to reflect who we have been as people, um, what our culture has been, where we've come from, not just sort of strict statements of fact, um, but also providing a little bit more context for who we are. So kind of bringing the human to the machine um, in some ways. So another way of potentially um, providing data to Wikidata would be through schema.org. And this, this works for the knowledge graph, or potentially works for the knowledge graph as well. It's just a little bit murkier. So the web that we generally think of is a giant decentralized library of documents. Um, the semantic web where you're using linked data is kind of like a giant decentralized database. Um, if you can crawl all of it and pull in, parse all of the data out of it, you have yourself quite an immense collection of data. Um, so many of you are probably familiar with being able to use things like RDFA or microdata or JSON linked data uh, to annotate pages so that humans can say, yes, this web page uh, is expressing this particular fact about this particular person um, and uh, that helps the machines not have to do all that natural language processing named entity recognition. They've got a much higher reliability state to work on. They might still want to do it for verification purposes, um, but that's a whole different matter. Um, and so you get to avoid some of the problems like this. Uh, might not be able to see um, the summaries for all of these news items in Google News when I search for modal. Um, the summary is, this is a modal window, capture settings dialog. This is a modal window, capture set caption settings dialog. Captions, audio track, full screen. This is a modal window. Um, so modal news is not really uh, a thing that most people are interested in, but it's a good cautionary tale uh, in that if you don't supply structured data, then machines do have to guess. And in these particular cases, what happened was the modal UI for these pages is inserted dynamically on page load by JavaScript. And it's inserted as HTML DOM elements, uh, the very root of the DOM under the body. And so now that we have advanced parsing search engines that understand how to render JavaScript, they render the JavaScript they find that they're the first block of text, which is usually the most important in most pages, is this modal settings dialog. And they say, well, that must be the description of the page. We'll just summarize that, because they didn't give us a description that we could understand via schema.org or something else. So don't do that. Don't put the modal elements of the first DOM element either, but that's you know, a whole different matter. Um, so some examples you may have seen are the open graph protocol. Um, and, What you see here is with Open Graph Protocol, they dump everything in the head. Um, so it's a very flat uh, sort of structure, um, generally. Um, in, and what you find is you'll see the title is Live Review, Midpoint, Music Festival. And then you have the meta title, which is Live Review, Midpoint, Music Festival. And then you have the Open Graph title, which is Live Review, Midpoint, Fe Music Festival. Super repetitive, right? You've got the same sort of thing for the meta description and the Open Graph description. Um, but that's for use primarily by Facebook or things that understand Facebook's open graph protocol markup. So if you want Twitter to understand your page, 
you need to add Twitter cards to the head. Um, and so you add in the Twitter description, Cincinnati is not a music city by, which is like, come on, don't say that. I just grabbed a random uh, Medium article about Cincinnati. So I apologize, I did not like try to choose something negative. Um, they also say what the image is. Open Graph said what the image was that you should use for your card. Um, and they identify where the, uh, the site was, or who published the site. Um, and all this is in the head. So you're starting to get this head that's very long and very repetitive. Um, so of course, there's a third way, which is schema.org. Um, and this doesn't have to be in the head, but often is in the head as well, in the form of JSON-LD. Um, and here we've got things that, again, live review, Midpoint Music Festival, and just because it's never 100% clear whether a consumer is going to understand headline of a news article, news article is the type up here, um, or the name as the name of the article, uh, why not put both? Um, so we repeat it in, in and of itself. And this also appears in the same medium um, head. So there's just a lot of metadata jammed in the head. Um, but you can see that the, at least, the schema.org data is a lot richer than we saw with the open graph and the, uh, the Twitter cards. Um, it is aspiring to provide more useful information than just providing a quick snippet and summary, uh, which seems to be the open graph and Twitter approaches. Um, but they could, w uh, Medium could have gone with inline RDFA or microdata. This is an RDFA example. And so um, I'm marking up the, uh, the, t the content just by saying, adding attributes. So I'm saying this is the schema.org vocabulary and it's a news article. Um, I can say with one shot, this is both the name and the headline, um, and it's going to be the human readable live review, so I don't have to repeat it as a separate property. I've just said it's the contents of this H1. Um, same sort of thing for the um, organization. The owl mag is the publisher. Uh, it's a type, it's got its own type, so a first class type of entity. It's got its own URL and it's got a name. So we can surface these entities within the page more than just you would have um, with the open graph or Twitter approach. So um, schema.org right now has um, almost 600 types and 900 properties. It's pretty rich, although as mentioned before, it doesn't have the equivalent of a uh, fictional character. Um, it doesn't have the equivalent uh, right now of say concepts. Um, there have been various proposals to try and put that in, but the idea of semantic web as a thing, just the idea of semantic web as a thing, still has to be a thing, which again, restricts your ability to classify the different types um, significantly. So there's a lot of work still to do, despite covering a lot of these different uh, communities of data and communities of practice. Over the last couple of years, it has transitioned from being a group that was run from behind company walls and sort of a uh, collaboration between Microsoft and Google and uh, Yahoo, um, and now it is a full W3C community group. Uh, so it's open and transparent processes, and they accept pull requests on GitHub. For a while, I was the, I think, second uh, committer for schema.org a couple of years back. Um, probably been blown away by now. Um, and that was entirely from moving to source control where you, know, you could fix typos. I'm really good at fixing typos. Um, but also contributing uh, full-on vocabulary. And it's extensible, not just in adding core terms, but also in um, defining extensions for entire categories. So things like uh, medical health um, sort of vocabulary, which can be incredibly extensive and deep, um, and which the core folks might not want to necessarily have a whole lot to do with because they don't know the domain. It's leave it to the, uh, the vocabulary experts, right? They just want to work on making sure that they work together. So virtue number two that Larry Wall talked about was impatience. So when you see the way to get to an end goal, you want to do it immediately, right? Um, so I had uh, the privilege, an extreme privilege of being able to take a sabbatical a couple of years back, I think 2013. So I jumped uh, headfirst into the bibliographic extension community, um, worked with a number of other people, um, but as the one of the only developers in the group. I was actually implementing this in live systems and seeing what worked and what didn't work uh, and helped kind of pull things along. So 
Uh, there was a scholarly article type in schema.org, but there was no way to attach that to a particular journal uh, where it had been published. So we filled that hole and provided all of the serial nature of uh, journals uh, like uh, TV series and radio series already had. Um, someone had suggested that we might be able to look at the things that libraries offer, the books and the uh, CDs and uh, the various uh, electronic resources that libraries offer similar to how the very commercial product offer structure had been created in schema.org. So I actually sat down and made that work in three different open source library systems, thinking that if we make it work by default, uh, just like we saw with a lot of the open graph um, and uh, Twitter cards in content management systems that are coming out now, if we do that with library systems, we'd start seeing that data getting out and being publicly visible, um, at least machine readable. Um, and I took it, a proposal that dated back to when schema.org first started uh, with comics uh, with some of, I think, um, someone from comics.org and someone from Marvel, originally from Marvel, um, had put together a proposal and I helped drag that across the finish line so it's now part of the bibliographic extension. Um, so it really got head first, foot first, at some weird position of like falling into schema.org or diving in. Um, I did about 10 different talks at conferences, published articles um, in 2013, 2014. Um, in Germany, Greece, a number in, in the United States, sort of the high level uh, library conferences. Um, and uh, started working on aggregating the linked data. So I figured, okay, after a couple of years, all this work, I wanna see what the impact has been. So I, uh, Virtue number three is hubris, you know, flying too close to the sun potentially. I, f I figured, okay, after all this work, you know, people must be convinced about the importance of schema.org, particularly in my little like library world. And so I created a directory of, directory of all library links. I can't even remember what the E is anymore, uh, data project, and uh, actually crawled the 4,000 pages that I could find for different libraries in Canada. And uh, the results were interesting. 525 of them had open graph uh, protocol title attributes. I'm pretty sure that just came from the CMS that they're using. 215 had schema.org name attributes. Um, so again, possibly, probably coming from the uh, content management system that they're using. A full 10 of them had Twitter cards. Um, I don't, to be fair, these are home pages of libraries, so you might not I don't know, you still might actually want to have a nice picture of your library show up in Twitter when somebody tweets about your library, maybe. Um, so 10 was pretty low. Only five used schema.org library, which had been there since like sort of the start of schema.org. Um, <laughs> so that felt pretty terrible. <laughs> um, so I'm not bitter um, about that. Uh, <laughs> I had a really great time building this crawler, which amazingly enough for all of the work that had been done on the semantic web for years, like a decade or more, nobody seemed to have pulled together one open source crawler that worked really well at extracting both RDFA, microdata, or JSON-LD. Um, I could not find one and I tried all the obvious ones. So I built one on uh, the Python RDF, RDF lib library. Python, by the way, yeah. My PyCon 2013 t-shirt underneath. Um, and so that's what I built it on. It's open source and available so anybody else can build on that as well. Um, if there's a community where, there, where data is being published and they want to act as an aggregator that could then possibly um, load that data into microdata, sort of, or sorry, into Wikidata, be the intermediary, that was what my plan was. I gotta figure out what my new plan is going to be. Um, so all that said, in my little niche world, um, schema.org is very successfully growing. Um, it gained 10% from 2014 to 2015 based on the sampling, uh, the sampling of the Wikidata commons, uh, which kind of take, sorry, the web data commons, which takes a, uh, a subset of the web and makes it available for analysis. Um, so that's a good sign. That paper uh, citation there was from 2016 as well. So it's coming. And I do want to end on a, a fairly positive note that I do believe the semantic web is alive and it's actually usable at this point. Um, the schema.org data is really rich in some communities, tends to be those where Google or others have actually started using some of the data very obviously, less so in other areas. Um, interesting how that works. 
Um, it can make sense to go out and grab schema.org data from some of your communities. It still makes sense to publish it. It always makes sense to publish it. Um, and it is use useful, I believe, to work with the Google Knowledge Graph search API to pull those, those IDs, which do have IDs and wiki data, and kind of work with those together. There's tons of other I IDs that you can link out from wiki data as well, but using those as a central search, search point or connecting point can be very useful. And it's not like the world is getting worse. The, the world of semantic, the semantic web and linked open data is actually getting better as we're going along. It's very visible with uh, how far Wikidata has come in four years. So if you have any questions, I have a sparkle endpoint. Um, you can, there's no microphone, but you can direct it to me and I'll repeat them. Um, the slides are online. I should have updated this. There's a, you can just go to coffeecode.net slash Ohio DevFest if you want, a little bit uh, simpler to get to. And I'll post them in the uh, general channel um, of the Slack as well, and I'm sure they'll be on the website uh, after the fact as well. Um, but anyways, so questions? Anyone worked with Wikidata? Chunked through the like six gigabyte, uh, something like 569 million triple dumps? No. There's a lot of data there. <laughs> um, but you can set it up. So I was looking through some of the system requirements. I haven't set it up myself because I don't have, I think they're suggesting that you would ha want a 16 gigabyte machine to host <coughs> that amount of data on Blaze Graph. There's other ways of working with it. You can, you could use grep to grep through looking for <laughs> the Google Knowledge Graph ID. I mean, it's, it's line, line notation in the JSON, right? So grep would actually be a perfectly fine tool What's that? Just how it froze. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I'm curious about uh, you know, how, how well uh, data links up between Google Knowledge Graph and, and Wikidata. Okay. Um, yeah, can you kind of speak to that a little bit? Or? Sure, sure. So the, the question was how well does um, knowledge, er, data link up between the Google Knowledge Graph and Wikidata? So are we talking specifically about uh, the identifiers? How many identifiers are there? Yeah. Okay, um, one thing just as an aside, I remember just playing around with this sort of very idea, um, looking at, you can do a count in, uh, in Sparkle, and I wanted to find out how many Sparkle IDs, um, how many instances of the g.co new knowledge graph IDs there were versus the uh, Freebase IDs. There's 6,000 uh, g.co IDs, which only come from the Google Knowledge Graph, so they're things that never existed in Freebase. So they're, they seem to con be continuing to provide data to Wikidata. Um, but the simplest sort of thing to do would be, why don't we pop open a new window? Ooh, let's even go incognito. We can, we can ask any question we want now. <laughs> let's find an ID, or, or a, a, a person, a place, a thing. Governor of Cincinnati, okay. Yeah, I, I don't think that's going to work out very well. Yeah, mayor, head of government. Yeah. Uh, so I'll try this. Cincinnati, there we go. Um, so here we have mayor of Cincinnati. Current office holder is John Cranley. Let's see. So I don't think there's going to be a... Yeah, there's no uh, Google Knowledge Graph or Freebase ID there, but for John Cranley, I'd be surprised if there isn't one. So we scroll down, place of birth, ah. Hmm, fascinating. He doesn't seem to have a, uh, an ID in, or at least that we see from the Google Knowledge Graph. So let's see what's in the Google Knowledge Graph. Where's that awesome demo of mine? Ohio DevFest. No, the wrong one, damn you. Uh, KG Discovery, there we go. Thank you, Chrome History, awesome bar. John Cranley, all right. So, he should have an ID. Try that again. All right, Cranley, copy his ID. This may not work very well but that's part of the fun, right? Um, so his ID is going to be m slash zero n. Um, what I'm going to need to do is, 
let's go to query wikidata.org and mm, I don't want to really live code this. That would live querying Sparkle is uh, that's not a forte of mine. Um, maybe I'll jump back to one of my examples. Uh, yeah, let's go way back. Where are our examples? There. Oh, thank you. No, that's, yeah, search API. There we go. Beauty. All right, so state governors. I just want to take a quick look and see if these have Freebase IDs here. Um, let's see, give me the person itself so I can look, no, not per on, person. There's, I should say, there's 17 and a half million um, statements. I'm sure many of those are statements about uh, IDs, but let's see. John Kasich, he's my, f my favorite example. And yeah, so he's got a ton of identifiers, right? So what we need to do is we need to look up property P646. Um, P646, all right, so I want uh, person with this WDT, by the way, is a simplification. Um, it's the truthiness. Uh, I think we're going to have to get going before I can finish this off because there are people already queuing out uh, and uh, clapping outside. But I will be 646. Six? All right, thank you. Talking, typing, thinking, all very difficult. I don't want state label, I just want the person. I don't want to order at this point. Um, and 646 is identifier. All right, so I want free base, something like that. Free base, and really what I want to do is I want to just count. So if I recall this correctly, which I probably don't, we can see how many people have Freebase? Nope, screwed up. Yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm not gonna be able to do this on the fly because uh, my Sparkle knowledge has dissipated at the end of the talk, I apologize for that. But uh, um, most of the, uh, the entities I was looking up seem to have, uh, most of the common entities, and maybe mayors don't get common enough uh, for that purpose, seem to have them. But that'd be an example of the sort of um, bot work that you could easily do. You could go through and pull all of the mayors um, from the, the Google Knowledge Graph and provide references in Wikidata with a bot uh, for the matching uh, entity. And you could use as your references came from the Google Knowledge Graph. So always work that potentially could be done. So, All right, any other questions? Since I handled that one so well. <laughs> Or statements? I'm just curious uh, to know, like, are there any great examples of like cool things that people are using to support um, projects that need some web validation? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Um, so they, so Wikidata does have uh, sort of their ongoing news and uh, promotion um, uh, at the top. So um, one of the things that uh, they do is they've got sort of a weekly newsletter. Um, uh, so Wikiversity, so Discover gives you some innovative applications and contributions. So I would suggest keeping an eye on these. These kind of update relatively frequently as new things come out. Um, yeah, I would suggest exploring on your own for some of that. Um, there's a lot of work certainly in the library space in terms of like trying to use these as an identifier to make things make sense across vast sets of holdings and data and archival materials and, uh. right. well, thank you very much. Thank you for coming to Ohio DevFest. Thank you for coming to my talk. And yeah, happy to talk more later, virtually or in, in person. <laughs>